right, all right. Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone's having a good Wednesday. I want to welcome you here tonight. Uh, man, you guys are spread out. The room's almost equally symmetric there. Can you get any further away, Blas? Like, come on, brother, help me out here. <laughs> All right, glad you guys are here. I'm going to get you to go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 5. And while you're turning there, got a couple of things to share with you, and then uh, we'll pray and get started tonight. But we'll be in Luke chapter 5 this evening together. A couple of things I want to share with you is that uh, starting in just two weeks, you guys, help us get this word out. You'll hear it on Sunday mornings. You'll uh, see it in our worship guide. You'll see it online. But we've got an on-campus new members class that's kicking back off. All of that kind of slowed down. We went to a video format through COVID, but we're coming back on campus. But it's going to be on Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings, four consecutive weeks, starting uh, March 6th. Sunday mornings, 9 o'clock, and we'll be in the room that we call Backstage, which is right behind me here, right behind the sanctuary. So look forward to that. I know we've got 20-plus uh, people signed up right now for that class and look forward to walking through the new member curriculum with everybody. We're calling that now Discover Richland Creek. So help us get that word out. Uh, the other thing that I want to highlight tonight is this Sunday we've got our monthly prayer service. So this Sunday, 6 p.m., right here in this room, I want to invite you all to come out and be a part of that as we pray corporately as the body of Christ. So hopefully you'll uh, come and join in on that time. And then finally, I actually want to make this a part of my opening prayer. Uh, not too many weeks from now, March 18th, which is what, three weeks or so. February is almost over, guys. Um, March 18th through the 20th is our Disciple Now weekend for our students, ages or grades 6 through 12. And I just want to be praying for that weekend, praying for the students that will participate, praying for all the leaders and volunteers who will be involved. It's an intensive weekend of discipleship and worship geared specifically for our students. So I'm excited about that. And if you have students, please get them registered. You can go online and do that. Or if you're here tonight and you have a desire to serve, you can also connect with uh, Pastor Stephen Moy regarding that. There's a wide variety of ways to serve through that weekend. So even if you can't commit to the whole weekend, you could do Friday or you could do Saturday. There's just different ways to, to jump in and be a part of that. So I want to encourage you along those lines. So Luke chapter 5, that's where we'll be tonight. Luke chapter 5, and I've got some context that I want to walk us through before we actually get to that passage. So bear with me as we work through some of the context, not only of Luke, but how this connects really to the whole of Scripture, because it really helps us see how the few verses we look at tonight uh, really connects across the board. So let me pray for us, pray for D-Now, pray for our time together tonight, and then we'll jump in uh, to the Word of God. Father, we're grateful that we can gather in your name tonight, grateful that we can be called your people, and we know, we confess, and just remind ourselves that that is solely because of your grace and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and we come tonight under the banner of the gospel. Lord, we want to be a people who are in love with you because you first loved us, and Part of that, Lord, is that we would love your word, that uh, your word and your spirit would continue to transform us into the image of your son. And so we pray tonight uh, that what we share, what we interact with tonight in your word would accomplish your will and your purpose in each one of our lives. As I think of that and pray in that vein for ourselves tonight, I do pray for that Disciple Now weekend. Uh, Lord, I pray for our students that would be engaging with the word and with worship and interacting, uh, whether it's in the corporate time or breakout groups, Lord, that your word would just wash over the lives of our students. We pray for salvations. We pray for strengthened walks. We pray for all of the leaders. Lord, we ask that you would be with them as they preach, teach, lead in worship, as they facilitate all that goes into that weekend. 
and for all the volunteers that will push into that, Lord, give strength, give energy, and Lord, that you would be glorified in it all. Uh, just as we press into equipping this next generation again to know you and to love you. So, Father, we commit that to you, into your hands and again, just commit this night into your hands. Thank you for each person here. Pray that you would accomplish your will in our lives. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 5, but before we get there, let me jump us into a little bit of context. I'm curious if you guys have ever in your life been fooled by something, duped by something, taken advantage of by someone or something. Maybe you put your financial eggs in a basket and got fooled by the outcome, or maybe it was a belief that you had at one point in your life, and it took you down a a path that kind of led you astray. I had a moment in my life, it was right after college. I just started uh, my first career, I guess you could say, as a civil engineer and was looking into life insurance. And I got connected with somebody who knew all about it and they they really talked a good game about what it could do and what, what it would yield, not only as life insurance, but a return and how that investment would grow and Fast forward about 10 years down the road, I looked at how much they were taking in fees versus how much this thing had grown over time and quickly got out of it. Probably should have gotten out of it way before then, but I was ignorant of those things and just riding on their advice, but I was duped, right? I was fooled by something and I I bought into it and it, it took me down a bad path. Well, you know, way beyond our finances or anything else. Think about what we believe, what we press into. And truth be told, everybody believes something. In fact, uh, quoting from one commentator I read this week, the Christ-centered exposition, he says, there are no unbelievers in this world, just people who believe in different things. Think about that for a minute. We all have a worldview. We all have a perspective We all believe in different things, and really what matters is the substance of our faith, and I want to press into that just a little bit. Another way to think of it is this, the object of our faith, the object of our belief, what we're hoping in, what we're trusting in, the object of our faith really matters. I noticed something as you guys walked in tonight that none of you tested the chairs you were sitting in. Did y'all notice that? Anybody like pick it up and examine it and look at it? You trusted that that chair was going to hold you up, right? Well, what if that leg was broken though? Like you've sat in chairs, you've trusted them, you've, you've seen them hold you up, but what if the chair you picked had a broken leg? The object of our trust and our faith matters because if you sat in that chair with a broken leg, you would fall on the floor, right? It it wouldn't go well for you in that moment. Well, press into that again a little bit more. What about our eternity? How much more important is it that we are certain, we are absolutely certain in what we believe? And so tonight, as we think about context, before we get into Luke chapter 5, we need to really consider Is our belief in Jesus Christ for certain? Are you anchored in that? And that's really the purpose of Luke. The same uh, commentator said, a person's faith is only as good as the object his faith is rested in. So it's not the magnitude of our faith or how much, like if you had sat in that chair and really, 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 really had faith in it, if the leg was broken, you would still fall no matter how much faith you had in it. So if the object of our faith is broken, really, let me say it this way, it's not about the magnitude of our faith, it's about the majesty of our Savior. It's about Him and His certainty and Him being truth. So let's think about the Gospel of Luke and its purpose right now. In general, the Gospels in general, they're, they're giving us a narration of Jesus' birth and his life, all the way to his death, his burial, his resurrection, they are there to give us a clear account 
of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Really, the, the purpose of Luke is seen there in Luke 1, verses 1 through 4. And you guys, I'm going to take you to some verses. You don't have to follow along. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a Bible drill. You guys stay in Luke chapter 5. But that passage says the following. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, this seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theopolis, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Let me ask this question. Why is Luke writing this gospel? What does he want us to come away with? He wants us to have a certainty of the things that they have heard. So Luke speaks of scripture being fulfilled. He speaks of eyewitnesses. He interviewed people who were eyewitnesses and he's now giving this account. He actually bookends his gospel, his letter there, with this idea of fulfillment of scripture with Jesus' words about fulfillment of scripture. Luke chapter 24, take a look there, verses 44 through 49. This is this Emmaus Road account where Jesus is meeting with some disciples after his resurrection. I'm not going to read that entire passage, but it's speaking there, verse 44, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled. There's that word again, fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. In other words, concerning Christ. So Luke says in Luke 1, he's writing an account of the things that were fulfilled. Luke 24, Jesus himself says, this is showing you that these things were fulfilled. And why is this happening in the gospel of Luke? Well, it's so that we would have certainty about what we believe. We want to make sure we're standing on a good foundation. John chapter 20, another example of this. John writes here and he says that there were some things that I recorded in this book. I'm paraphrasing, but then in verse 31, but these are written, why? that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you have life in his name. I'm just giving you another example of a gospel, in this case, the gospel of John, the purpose of him writing is so that you would have certainty in what you believe. That's important for us. So a couple other reminders here. These are not just the thoughts of, of man. Remember, in 2 Peter Chapter 1, a beautiful thing is happening as scriptures are being penned. Verse 20 there of Second Peter chapter 1, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy never came about by the will of man, but holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, what Peter's saying here is that we can, again, have certainty in the scriptures because it's not just the thoughts of man. It's not just Luke and John writing down what they saw. Notice what happens there. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. Another way to think of this is they were carried along by the Holy Spirit to pen these words. Another passage that speaks to that, 2 Timothy, familiar passage for you guys 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all scripture is what? Given by the inspiration of God. Some translations say, are God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God can be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
So again, scriptures, God breathed. I'm connecting these dots. Like Luke and John had a purpose, but it wasn't just drummed up in their own hearts. God breathed these words through these men. The Holy Spirit carried these men along. It's important that we have this certainty. It's important that we know where our faith is residing. So let's dig a little bit closer to the text that we've got for tonight. Luke tells us that he he wants us to have a certainty about what we believe. So we find ourselves in the middle of Luke where he is he's unpacking Christ's ministry. Luke chapter 4. Jesus is casting out demons. He's healing Peter's mother-in-law. Luke chapter 5, he's cleansing a leopard. He forgives a paralytic that's lowered through a roof. And because of the disbelief of those around him, he also heals this man. He forgives and he heals. Luke 6, he heals on the Sabbath day. He also heals a great multitude who are flocking around him. Many, it doesn't even give us the number were healed. Why is this important that Luke is showing us the ministry of Christ, these miracles? Sometimes it's healing, sometimes it's walking on water or calming a storm. Why is it important that Luke is showing us this thing? Because he's establishing who Christ is. He's establishing that the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of God, is here. He's in our midst. These healings, these miracles, they validate who Jesus is. In John chapter 5, we see something similar. Jesus is fussing with the Pharisees. I like that phrase. He's fussing with the Pharisees, and he says, Look, guys, you're not believing my own testimony, but there's a fourfold witness about me. First, there was John the Baptist. Then he mentioned God the Father's own testimony, and he's referring back to Jesus' baptism, where God the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So there's John the Baptist, there's God the Father. He mentions the scriptures there, but there's a fourth witness, and it's the very thing we just talked about. It's the healings, it's the work. He says the works, the miracles that I have done in front of you could only come from God himself. So this fourfold witness in the book of John, one of those witnesses, if you will, that's testifying of Christ is the very miracles that he's doing. So Luke and John, again, I'm partnering them together to say how they are validating this. Acts chapter 2, we see it again. Peter is preaching at Pentecost, and he says there in Acts chapter 2, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by what? Miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. He appeals to the miracles, wonders, and signs, just like Luke does in the gospel, just like John does in his gospel. So again, we're going a little further into this, but these men carried by the Holy Spirit are sharing Christ's ministry with us to validate, to establish that Jesus is the Messiah. And that begins to set the stage for Luke chapter 5. As Christ is moving out in ministry, this classic battle arises. I just called it fussing with the Pharisees. Christ versus the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time. As Christ heals, they grumble. As he restores, they plot. As he forgives, they fuss. So that's what we're walking into is all these miracles are happening and the Pharisees, the scribes, they're starting to get worked up. So let's go to Luke chapter 5. It's the calling of Matthew there in verses 27 through 30. The calling of Levi or the calling of Matthew. It says there, after these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he, being Levi, left all. He rose up and followed Jesus. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. 
And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And here it is, verse 30. And their scribes and their Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? What a great time to talk about tax collectors as we walk into tax season, right? There's dirty scoundrels. I actually like mine. He's a good guy. He's a good friend. They were not known for being good back in this day because they would awfully, often skim off the top. They were scandalous, so to speak. But Levi, this tax collector, it says here, Jesus says, follow me. And man, he leaves it all and he follows Christ. And he, he's so overjoyed that he, he throws this feast. There's a party going on. There's excitement taking place. Many of his friends gather and the Pharisees there say, why do your disciples, why are these Christ followers hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? They're, they're grumbling. They're complaining. Take a look now at verses 31 and 32. How does Jesus answer their question? Jesus answers and says to them, those who are well, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So y'all help me, paraphrase it. Y'all can speak up. You gotta speak up loud so I can hear you. What is Jesus saying there to answer the Pharisees? What's his response? Come on, guys. Okay. Okay. Yep. Touching on, on it well. He said he's not there to, to reach those who already believe, but the non believer. Let's press into that just a little bit more. Think about who he's talking to. There's a little bit of irony in Jesus' response here. The Pharisees thought that they were the religious elite and they had it all in the bag. They thought by keeping the law, which actually they couldn't do perfectly, by the way, or their man-made laws that they tacked on to the law of God, they thought they were righteous. So Jesus is saying, I'm not here to, to impress you because you think you've got it all figured out. This other crowd that's here that's looking to me as the Messiah, I'm here to reach them. Now the truth is Jesus is there to reach the Pharisees too. But he's, he's working into their lives and starting to bring a teaching to them that's going to be a hard teaching for them to swallow. And so there's a little bit of irony here when he presses into this. And he says, look, those who know they're sick, they need a doctor. And I'm here as the great physician to spiritually minister to them. You know, if I, if I go, or if I'm... If I'm ill and I pretend like I'm not, then I don't want to see the doctor. I know we got some men in the room here. Some of us men don't like to go to the doctor. We like to pretend everything's okay. In a sense, the Pharisees think they're okay. They think they're righteous. Jesus says, look, y'all got it all figured out. But these folks over here, they know they're broken. They know they are without hope. And they're actually coming to me and I'm here to minister to them so hearing that response we're finally to the text for tonight Luke chapter 5 verses 33 through 39 let's read that whole section together you've got it on the screens if you've got your Bibles there with you let's read that whole thing together and then we'll go back and we'll look at this and kind of go verse by verse work our way through it. So Jesus has given them this answer. Verse 33, then they said to him, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And he said to them, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them 
and they will fast in those days. Then he spoke a parable to them. He actually connects three parables together. Verse 36. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new one makes a tear. And also, the piece that it was taken out of, the new one, does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Or else the new wine will burst and the wine will burst the wine skin, wine skins and will be spilt, and the wine skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wine skins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says that the new, or excuse me, the old is better. So think about what just happened. Jesus gives them a response to their question about their disciples eating and celebrating with a bunch of sinners. He gives them an answer, but they don't even address the answer. Like, they they can't even confront that answer. They just go on to the next complaint. And the context seems to be this same party because he's talking about instead of eating and drinking and celebrating, Man, you guys ought to be what? Fasting and praying, right? That's what verse 33 is speaking to. With, with no rebuttal to his previous response, they lob another complaint. You know, the they in this is debated. When it says they said to him, it might be the scribes and the Pharisees. It may be another group in that crowd. But nonetheless, the scribes, The scribes and Pharisees are brought up again because he says, you know, John's disciples fast and pray, and so do the Pharisees. Why aren't yours? After all, which one sounds more holy? Which one sounds more righteous? Prayer and fasting or eating and drinking? Right? Prayer and fasting. Like that, like we put that stuff on our spiritual disciplines list, and it's not that it's bad, but these scribes and Pharisees are missing what's going on all around them. They're caught up in their own self-righteousness and they're just looking for an opportunity to make Jesus stumble. They want to catch him in something. They want to trap him in the corner. They want to paint him in the corner. Remember, to that end, apparent piety may be the furthest from God's actual heart. Matthew 18, excuse me, Matthew 15, verse 8 says the following. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But what? Their heart so far from me. Jesus is challenging the heart of the Pharisee here. Yes, you do all these things. You check your boxes. You present yourself as righteous. Maybe we would use the word self-righteous. But you know nothing of my salvation. You're very far from me in your heart. There's an element here that ties back to last week. Remember Pastor Mike last week taught on the prodigal son. There's an element of the older brother here, right? He was the one who grumbled and complained because of the party that was going on. When his brother returned and the father lavished him with grace and acceptance. Can you hear the Pharisees here again? There's a party going on right here. Like, there's a celebration. Levi has met the Messiah and he's throwing a banquet and he's introducing all his lost friends to Jesus. And the Pharisees are in the same room missing the Messiah. And they're grumbling about it. Fasting often in the Old Testament, has a picture of repentance and glum and sorrow. Think of ashes and sackcloth and renting your clothes. Jesus is like, that's not the time for this. There will be a time for that, but it's not right now. Look at verses 34, 35. We'll see one of Jesus' response to this. He says there, 
Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. and Then they will fast in those days. A little bit of context here. When we think about a Jewish wedding and what all it entails, there's different angles to this and you can break this down in different ways. But in general, there's four stages to a Jewish wedding. There's the contract. There's a moment where the families agree and a dowry is paid for the bride. And you enter into this agreement together. Then there's a time of preparation where the bridegroom, the groom, goes and prepares. And oftentimes this would even be getting ready like within his father and mother's house, a place for them to stay. I saw this not in a Jewish context, but on one of my trips to China, I saw how the parents of the groom dedicated a room that would be the bedroom for the bride. And there was a moment where the, the groom went and prepared this place and he decked it out and they brought in all these decorations to make it beautiful for his bride. A similar thing would happen here. And then after that time of preparation, you actually got to the wedding celebration. And this, my friends, was a big deal. Sometimes seven days worth of celebration. Like some of us cringe at the thought of a wedding that's just a few hours. Imagine seven days. I don't want to have to pay that bill, right? I don't want to have to plan that party, right? Seven days worth of celebration. And then really the final aspect was the consummation, the the pronouncement of husband and wife, and they would go back and live together where the groom had prepared this place. And so Jesus uses this picture of a wedding to say during the celebration, this seven-day celebration, there's no calls for mourning and fasting. There's no calls for us to, to be downcast. We should be enjoying this moment. Now, The friends of the groom especially, like this is the dude they grew up with and they're supporting him in this and there's great celebration. But when he leaves them, there might be a moment of sadness where fasting and sadness might be appropriate. But it's not right now. So what's Jesus saying in response to their question about fasting and praying versus eating and drinking? He's saying that right now, guys, The Messiah, Jesus, is in your presence. The kingdom of God is in your midst. It's a time to celebrate. The lost are being saved. Levi's come to faith, and he's bringing his friends to meet me. What a beautiful picture. A time to celebrate rather than to mourn. And they can't see it. What was Jesus speaking of when he spoke of this time to celebrate? A time when the groom, remember something Pastor Mike said last week, when you're looking through a parable, you can't find purpose in every sentence. And this might be one of those moments where there's not an exact correlation. Is Jesus talking about the time from his arrest to his resurrection? Like that moment where the disciples would be in dismay and they would be doubtful and fearful because their leader just got arrested and he's being tortured and he's going to a cross and they don't yet see the resurrection, that perhaps is the moment where Jesus is saying, there's a time when the the groom is not with you. And that's a time to fast and pray. Some think that this is more about the time where Jesus ascended back to heaven after his resurrection. And now we're awaiting for him to return we would call that the church age the age that you and I live in right now I'm not certain that's it because first Peter chapter 1 speaks of how we greatly rejoice right now in light of our inheritance and the future hope of the return of Christ like right now we should have abundant life in Christ so if Jesus is trying to make a direct correlation to his own life there I would lean more towards the time between his arrest and his resurrection. Because post-resurrection is a time to celebrate. 
And that's what we as the church celebrate. Think about it this way as well. During this time of celebration, the Messiah was with these disciples. And that was beautiful and something to enjoy. Like they were in the presence of the master, hearing him teach, watching him heal. This was their everyday experience. Think about us today. I don't see Jesus physically, but we have the indwelling spirit of God in us. How much more so should we experience the abundant life? How much more so should we be joyful in our Christian walk? Not to say that we don't face trials and tribulations and hardships. We can all name those things. But in the midst of them, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God that should bring us, even as First Peter says, great, great joy. So what's the key point in Jesus' answer here? What's the nugget that we're unearthing and looking at here? I'm going to phrase it a few different ways. The Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, the promised one, is standing in front of of these scribes and Pharisees, and they should be overjoyed, but rather they are piously challenging the only one who could actually keep the law. They were elevating their self-righteousness. The master and the Messiah is performing miracles in their midst. He's saving sinners and ushering in the kingdom And we should celebrate that. But instead, the religious elite who were looking to their own laurels, not needing the help of a savior, but thinking they had it in the bag, those self-reliant religious people scoff, ridicule, and try to trip up Jesus. The main point that Jesus is making here is that Now's the time to celebrate because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The irony, sinners are embracing Christ and the religious elite are grumbling and complaining. Well, to drive this a little bit further, Jesus jumps into these three parables. He he talks there about old and new cloth. He talks there about old wineskins and new wineskins. He talks there about old wine and new wine. Some of y'all are here tonight to see what Pastor John thinks about wine. That's the only reason y'all came here tonight. I know that's why Chuck's here. We're not even going to talk about that at all. Y'all won't even know my opinion of that before we leave tonight. What we are going to talk about is what does Jesus mean by these parables? He uses the word new Eight times, eight times in four verses. That should clue us in on something. When you see repeated words or phrases, there's a main point coming to the surface here. He's driving home something that these Pharisees, and I would venture to guess that you and I need to hear today. So he strings together three different parables. Verse 36, a new garment and an old garment. Let's read that one again. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new one does not match the old. I'm going to tell my age here a little bit. I grew up not with Levi's and Wrangler jeans, but I grew up with tough skins. Anybody else in here know what tough skins are? Come on. Chuck, no, you ain't raising your hand. You know what it is. Sears and Robux, tough skins. We used to go to the outlet, Sears and Robux, and that was it. When I, when I got to be in junior high, I thought I had to be cool, so I was begging mom for some Levi's at that point, right? So I was pretty rough on my tough skins. I was a boy. I grew up on a farm. I rode dirt bikes. We did farm stuff. I played sports, and it didn't take very long for the knees on those jeans to to wear out how silly would it be 
for mom to go to the Sears and Robux outlet store, buy some new tough skins and cut the knee out of them, take them to my old worn out jeans and sew the new patch into that. What happens in that moment if she did that? She ruins the new pair of jeans, right? It's, it's got a hole in it now. So why would you mess with the new? Why would you mess it up? Well, even with the old, one of the things Jesus says here is if you sew a new garment into an old garment, when you wash it, when you dry it, the new garment does what? It shrinks or it changes. When it changes, it starts to rip and tear even at the old fabric. It starts to do damage to the thing that you actually tried to repair with it. So Jesus uses this picture of an old garment and a new garment, and you can't mix the two. Let's say it that way. You you can't bring these two things together. So I googled tough skins, and guess what I read? One site said they're now vintage. I said, what? 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 I should have saved some of those things. I could have probably put them on some site for a bunch of money. So the moral of the story, you can't mix the old and the new. Let's keep pressing into this. He, he told two more parables here. New wine and old skin, and, and new wine and old wine skins. Verse 37 and 38. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins, or else the new wine will burst the wine skins and be spilt. And the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. And both are preserved. What is Jesus saying when he brings up this idea of new wine, old wineskins, new wine and new wineskins? What's he pressing into? Well, a little chemical reaction happens with new wine. As it begins to ferment more, as it sits with age... It releases gases, right? Those gases begin to expand. Oftentimes, old wineskins would be what? Brittle. They would be dry rotted. So you put the new wine in it, and as it begins to expand, you can just picture the seams bursting, the the goat skin kind of ripping and tearing. Jesus is saying you can't put the new in the old. It's not going to work. New wine has to go in to new wineskins so that as it ferments, it begins and begins to expand, the skins can expand with it. The moral of the story is what? You can't mix the new with the old. You see a pattern here? Eight times the word new is mentioned in four verses. And we're just a little ways into this. Whether cloth or wineskins, the main point is that you can't mix old and new. Let's state this another way for us tonight. You can't mix faith in your self-righteousness and faith in Christ. The two don't mix. You can't put them together. You can't mix the old covenant with the new covenant. You can't bring those two together. Romans chapter 11, the first part of Verse 6, and if by grace, then it's no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. It's either all grace or it's all works. You can't mix the two together. As soon as I try to bring my belief in Christ in conjunction with my self-effort, As soon as I add an ounce of my self-effort into the thought of my salvation, then I've, I've wrecked grace. Grace is no longer grace as soon as you bring our self-righteous works into it. Can't mix. Can't do it that way. Well, then what is the purpose of that old covenant? What is that purpose of the law? Galatians chapter 3 speaks to that. Therefore, the law was our tutor. That's an important word, tutor, teacher, taskmaster. The law was our teacher to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified 
What's that word? By faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor. I'm justified through faith in Christ. His righteousness, not my own. His righteousness applied to me. Beautiful thing that happens in salvation. But I want to marry this together with Romans chapter 11. If I bring an ounce of my my good works, my righteousness into this, then I don't have genuine faith in Christ. I'm trying to mix the two together. And according to Christ, in Luke chapter 5, I can't mix the old and the new. The new was standing in front of them, face to face. The Messiah was there. And he's saying, guys, you're trying to do this through your own self-efforts. You can't. You can't earn your way into the kingdom of God. So the purpose of the law, a tutor, a teacher, a taskmaster to do what? To show us how we all fall short of the glory of God. I was very young as I began to understand because I grew up in church. My parents took me to church. I began to hear early on the Ten Commandments. And I began to see very early that I wasn't meeting the mark. Just just think about a couple of those. Like, honor your father and mother. Let's just pick that one. Man, I blew that time and time again. And I knew that I blew that time and time again. Let's pick another one. Don't bear false witness. Man, I lied. I had absolutely lied to try to get out of trouble. You better believe I tried to skirt punishment by lying about something. Strike two, right? What's another one? Don't covet. Man, I'd looked at my friend's Atari and I wanted that thing. Absolutely. I didn't have one in my house. I wanted that. I had coveted in my heart, right? Strike three. So I press myself up against the law which is a picture of God's holiness, and I begin to see that I don't hit the mark. You see what the law has done in my life at that point? It's been a tutor, a teacher, to show me, to show me that I need Jesus. The law exposes our sinfulness and our helplessness and our need for a Savior. The Pharisees, were still living as though they could hit the mark. They thought they had it all figured out. They were lying to themselves as they did that, which is why Jesus said to them earlier, I'm here to help those who know they're sick. But those who think they're well, they don't need a Savior. The reality is they did. But Jesus is using that irony to show them the fallacy of their thinking. So I'm not saved by keeping the law because we can't. We're only saved through faith in Christ who did keep the law and paid the penalty for our sin. He presses one more time into this. We'll jump to one last verse, verse 39. New and old wine. Jesus wraps this thought together with a stinging irony. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires the new, for he says the old is better. Picture who he's talking to. The Pharisees. What are they holding on to? What have they drunk? Right? What are they tasting and trying to cling to? The old. And he says, if you if you drank old wine, then you don't want the new because you think the old is better better so they're questioning Jesus they remember they're trying to paint him in a corner they're trying to trip him up like he's this new guy on the scene he's doing all these miracles he's healing people he's walking on water he's controlling storms and everybody's starting to take notice who doesn't like that the scribes and the Pharisees because they're losing their crowd while Jesus gains his And they don't want to lose power. They don't want to lose prestige. And they're stuck in this old. Let's 
think through that just a little bit more. The old what? The old covenant. Jesus ushers in the new covenant. Jesus tells us in Luke 22 that at Passover, when he, when he did the Lord's Supper with his disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Jesus is the new. He's ushering in the new covenant. He's ushering in the kingdom of God, and he's telling the scribes and the Pharisees, guys, you're holding on to the old, and you're missing the new. So whether it's old wine, new wine, whether it's old cloth and new cloth, or whether it's new wine and old wineskins, what's the moral of the story? Did y'all get it tonight? You can't mix the new and the old. So how does that apply itself to our lives? That's where we've got to land the plane. This same expositor, the Christ-centered exposition, this same commentator said, we must abandon our self-righteousness so that we can receive the righteousness of another. The perfect gracious Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's think about how that applies. You know, Pharisees exist in our culture even now. They may even exist in our church even now. Two ways to think about that. First, those, there are those who fail to see the Messiah. They fail to see the need for a Savior because they think their own Religion and righteous acts are going to earn their way into heaven. They're, they're looking at their lives thinking, I measure up pretty good. And so I, I must be okay. I can, I can make the payment for my sin and I can earn my way into heaven. They're looking to trust in their own laurels. Remember how we started tonight? What was the reason for Luke writing? He wanted us to know for certain that what we believe was truth. And it was a solid foundation, specifically Jesus Christ. Because that's what the gospel is all about, is Jesus Christ. He wanted us to know. So I ask you a question tonight. Are you certain where your faith rests? Just like that chair with a broken leg. Is the object of your faith certain? What are you trusting in? Who are you trusting in for forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It's a, what, gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If in any way, shape, or form you are trusting in your own good works for salvation, and let me describe that two ways. Maybe that's all you're trusting in here tonight. And you realize that Jesus, through the word of God, is meeting with you tonight saying, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who laid down his life for your sins, and I'm here to offer you salvation. Maybe Maybe you're trusting in your good works and you see the Messiah for the first time this evening. You want to put your faith in him. Maybe you're here tonight and you realize through the word and through the power of the spirit at work in this moment that you were doing something that I call Jesus plus. Jesus plus my efforts equals salvation. Remember what we learned tonight. You can't mix the new with the old. It is not your good work. So as soon as you say Jesus plus my good works, you've dictated that the cross is void. You have said to Jesus who died for your sin, that's really nice, but that wasn't enough, Jesus. Let me add to it. You can't add to what Jesus did through his death, his burial, and his glorious resurrection. It's not Jesus plus. It's just Jesus? Have you placed your faith in Jesus? Are you a Pharisee who's 
walking in the church, doing churchy things, serving, going to life group, here tonight, but you realize for the first time, I've never genuinely set aside my righteousness and trusted the one who truly is righteous. Tonight can be the night of your salvation. He's ready to receive you. The second application to this, there's another way that we can be pharisaical within the church. Sometimes it comes from those who are truly, genuinely saved, but they've forgotten to apply the gospel to their daily lives. And they're doing pretty good in their walk, and they, man, things are selling pretty well in their spiritual disciplines. Genuinely saved, they know it's just Jesus, and their faith is genuinely there, but they've gotten to this point of religious, like, merit, and they're, they're doing the right things, but they're taking credit for it. And they're forgetting that they wouldn't be living this way without the gospel and the Holy Spirit in their life. And here's a few examples. Pastor Mike gave a few of these last week, so some of them will be familiar. They might be worded a little different. I have to give credit to this to one of my seminary professors from a couple decades ago. I pulled out his notes because I remembered him hitting me square between the eyes and maybe in the heart when he walked through some of this in my own life. So listen to this. When we begin to live void of the gospel applied to and recognized daily in our lives, we begin to look pharisaical. Here's some warning signs of that. He gets angry when life doesn't go his way. She lacks the joy and abundant life that comes through Christ. There's no delight in the Father's love, mercy, and grace. Remember part of what we looked at tonight? There was a party going on. Sinners were coming to salvation. Levi was excited. There was joy. That joy fades away when we lose sight of the gospel. Let's dig a little deeper. Her obedience is shallow with underlying motives of personal gain the praise of man, or trying to keep God's smile upon her life. He imposes his personal piety on others. He makes his religious rules more important than Jesus and the gospel. He minimizes his own sin while maximizing others. He begins to lose graciousness and neighbor love and a cloud of judgmental attitudes towards others. The last one, there's an inability to forgive or rejoice when God works in someone else's life. You've lost the celebration. Remember the prodigal son, the the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son? In each one of those and in tonight's, there was celebration of the lost being found. Do you celebrate when people come to Christ or do you judge them? Have you forgotten to get the plank out of your own eye and you're consumed with the speck in your neighbors? That's a pharisaical attitude. We've got to guard ourselves. The best way to guard ourselves from that is to preach the gospel to yourself every day. If you see that judgmental attitude or maybe some of these warning signs jump up in your life, the way you come to Christ is repentance and faith. The way you walk with Christ is repentance and faith. So if you see it, repent of it. And by faith, keep walking with the gospel on the forefront of your mind. I want to close with this thought. May the certainty of Christ... Remember, we use that word, the certainty. Luke shares these words so that you can be certain in whom you have believed. May the certainty of Christ and your faith in him lead you to love him more, worship him wholeheartedly, and serve him fiercely. Not just a knowledge of him, but a white-hot relationship with him. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful. For your goodness, your grace, we're thankful that you, Jesus, have ushered in the new. We could not save ourselves, and you acted on our behalf.
Thank you, Lord Jesus, for salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace. Father, if there's one in this room that you're stirring in their heart right now, maybe they've leaned on their own good works. And tonight's the night where your spirit is drawing them to yourself. Lord, continue that work. May the scales fall off and may they run to Jesus, acknowledging their sin, acknowledging his sacrifice and his resurrection and placing their faith in him. May tonight be the night of their salvation. And Father, if any of us can identify with an attitude of a Pharisee, reveal it to us, correct us, grow us, help us have victory over that stronghold in our lives. Lord, help us to celebrate your grace, not only in our life, but in the life of others as you stir and work in our midst. Lord, we thank you again for your love, your mercy, and your grace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.